Okay, so now we're going to have an a open forum, and what I propose is we start out um, the Silvera family and their representative, Mr. Trotter, would like to do about a five to ten minute presentation. Uh, Bill McNicholas and his team are looking at about a ten to fifteen minute presentation. Um, I think you'll find that this will all build our knowledge base further. Um, these folks have been very intimately involved in different aspects. Then let's just pass a couple microphones around and, and really, again, questions, concerns, comments, everything on the table. So, um, Dave, why don't you start? Thanks, Damon, very much. Appreciate this opportunity to address the group here tonight. Uh, my name is David Trotter. I'm an attorney representing the Silvera family. I just as an aside, uh, I had my own city council meeting I was supposed to be at starting at 7 o'clock tonight, so I'm missing my own council meeting where I'm an elected official. Uh, so I'm happy to be here in Marin. I practice law over in Tonkos County. Um, the Silvera family has reviewed the proposed RAP. They have a number of comments and serious concerns with respect to the RAP and its proposed response to the off-site migration of, PC, of the PCE plume, which has contaminated the groundwater on their property. Mm -hmm. And the Silvera's comments are supported by a technical review of the RAP, which has been undertaken by Fred Clark, who is a professional geologist uh, with the Source Group, Inc. And Mr. Clark's written comments on the proposed RAP will be submitted to the Water Board in a separate letter in the next few days. And I'm going to be speaking to some of the points that he has based upon his technical review. But the key point here is this, the monitored natural attenuation, which they refer to as MNA, that's being proposed in the RAP, is a passive and we believe insufficient response to the residual PCE and other uh, vol volatile organic compound contamination that is both en route to the, the, the Silvera property and is already within the soils and groundwater on the site. And so Stephen, when you talk about the fact that there is contamination, probably, most likely there is contamination east of the Eastern Hotspot on the state of California property along the Highway 101 corridor, and there's no containment for it at the present time, and it's headed toward our client's property. That gives us some concern. So we're very pleased that, that in your presentation you indicated that one of the deficiencies that the Water Board staff sees is that there's not active remediation being proposed for the groundwater that's on site and already on the Silvera property. That's a very important point for us. And there are a number of reasons why we believe that uh, that, that, um, that MNA is not a sufficient response. Uh, and let me just talk about a few of them. The first is that the attenuation is dependent on a number of different factors. And these include uh, completion of the in situ soil remediation and reduction of the PCE levels, which still hasn't happened fully on site. Um, and so when that hasn't happened, that increases the risk that there will be additional migration from the, the impacted site that will eventually get off site, go underneath the state of California property, and head on east with the prevailing groundwater. So the notion that MNA, that you just sort of monitor it and see what happens, that's a concern. And there's also concern about timeliness. Um, Mr. Clark's done some calculations, which will be shared. But basically, he calculated that the, the length of the plume currently from the source to the, to the, the full extent of the plume on the Silvera property is about 1,950 feet. And if you make some assumptions about the, the groundwater gradient here, which is very shallow, which means it doesn't go very fast, and you do some calculations and some assumptions based upon the soils that are subsurface. His calculation is that, that for the amount of water that's in that, that 1,950 feet, the amount of time it would take for that to all turn over and go past the Silvera property is approximately 30 years. Oh. Okay, that's 30 years that conservatively we're talking about potentially having monitored natural attenuation. And it could be longer if, in fact, the, the pores in the soil are not as, or tighter pores, water doesn't move as fast, it could take longer than 30 years. But his assumptions were based upon the median 
medium you know, grain sand, which is probably the most likely prevailing condition on site. So that's, that's issue one with respect to time. The second concern that we have is that there's no data that's been presented in the wrap for the purpose of discussing uh, appropriate bioremediation techniques to eliminate the VOCs, which would be the only way you could do anything active. That would be bioremediation of one kind, we believe. Uh, there's no study of soil types. There's no studies of groundwater chemistry or bacterial type and counts. That's not presented in the RAP or the feasibility analysis. And in that regard, here's something that we believe is significant. Mr. Clark believes is significant. Uh, it's that the PCE daughter products, the thing, the breakdown products, it goes from PCE to TCE to, to cis to ethyl chloride, so vinyl chloride, and then finally to something that's not carcinogenic. Um, the concern here is that based upon the current groundwater data that they've gotten, uh, it doesn't appear that those breakdown products are appearing in very large uh, concentrations at the present time. They're basically stuck at PCE. They don't seem to go past the 1-2 the, the DCE. And the concern here is that, you know, again, that, that supports the indication in the data, which has not been adequately set forth in the RAP, that monitored natural attenuation will take decades to achieve. And frankly, that's not a reasonable outcome for the Silvera family um, because they have an impacted down gradient property owner they depend on their groundwater for the domestic water wells serving their facility, their employee homes, and their livestock. And frankly, it's, it's an impact to their land. And so the notion that there, there be, could be decades of monitored attenuation and it doesn't actually work, and that there's nothing in this wrap that requires an active remediation solution, that's not something that is acceptable to them. And Mr. Clark in his comments would have, have suggested ways to reduce that cleanup time from a few decades to perhaps several years, which would seem to us to be more reasonable. And that approach is exactly the kind of thing that's been used and followed at other sites in California and can and should be employed in this case. Uh, we believe that the, the water board should require several lines of treatment zones perpendicular to the flow of the groundwater uh, and that those be appropriately placed. There could be one to the east of the eastern hotspot. There should be one uh, on or at the property line between Caltrans and the Silvera Ranch. Places where you put in place, you know, injection materials that the groundwater has to pass through and hopefully that will result in uh, this uh, attenuation actually occurring so that we get to uh, results for these VOCs that are below the drinking water standard of five parts per billion. And the, the point here is that right now, because of the nature of the way things have gone, uh, with uh, both Marinwood Plaza and their environmental consultant, um, we really don't have as good an understanding of the groundwater chemistry and bacterial makeup uh, in the soils there. That would have to be acquired and analyzed, hasn't been done yet. Seems to me it should be done. Uh, that'll be another uh, comment made by Mr. Clark. Uh, and again, those kinds of active bio remediation zones and barriers have been routinely applied in other places in California uh, with good success at reducing the dissolved phase VOC load in shorter time frames. And this is all about time. Three decades is not, is not a reasonable period of time. There's a question at the back. I, I'm going to go over my comments and then I'll. I'll answer your questions if you have any, although I'm not really necessarily the right person to be answering those questions. Um, some other minor points, but significant points to the Silvera family. One is that the RAP should provide a guarantee of continuing and long-term wellhead treatment for any groundwater development north or south of the creek if that's something that the Silvera family needs, since such wellhead treatment is already called out for in the one well south of the creek. And the Water Board should expressly require that all financial and operational costs of such wellhead treatment are to be borne by Marinwood Plaza and or any successor in interest after the site is sold. And then finally, although no contaminants have been found in Miller Creek to date, the plan on the raft to sample further downstream is important 
This is because the current sample points may not be below the actual interception of the plume within the, with the creek. And if the creek is threatened, then as a sensitive receptor, a more aggressive approach to remediation and protection would be in order. So I'll come back to what I said earlier. The Water Board should require implementation of more active remedial measures to reduce PCE levels in the groundwater to compliant MCLs and to reduce the corresponding time frame for that to occur, which after all, the stated goal of, this pro of the RAP uh, for this project site is to get into the RAP, is to get to below five parts per billion, and there's no actual measures proposed in the RAP to get there. All they're talking about is monitoring it, and we don't think that's sufficient. So I would be happy to answer any questions, but frankly, yes, sir. Please. Simple one. I understand your concerns, and the 22nd is the deadline. You've made your statement public, which is a real concern. How does that impact what happens after February 22nd? If you continue the dialogue, does that take us out another year before something's done, or does the work start? And then as they go through and remove everything, they work on taking care of all the testing downstream and all, all of your personal concerns, which I respect. All right. We're going to be submitting written comments on time by the, by the 22nd. We're just members of the public like everybody else. Correct. Then, 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 then it's in the hands of the water board. What will happen? Well, and I, and I think they started too early, and we'll that will be a good end point, like what happens from here. Dave, I thought you raised a great uh, point about uh, monitored natural attenuation, mm -hmm. something I also raised in my letter. Um, I think at some point we we'll want to hear more about what that is from, and what, uh, and I think the regional water board can speak to that. So, so Renee has a few. Okay, like absolutely, Renee. Well, do we have to actually vacate at 930 or what's going on? I think we're good on time. So I'd like to invite my client. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock lights out. I would like to invite my client, Renee Silvera, to make a few statements. We'll make a brief, a brief comment. Thanks very much for being here tonight. Um, I just want to footnote um, Dave's presentation and say that my family very much cares about the, the plaza area itself and the Casa Marin neighborhood as well. My dad's father got started in Deering um, at the Miller Ranch, which is right where the plaza is now. That's actually where the old dairy facility was. So my dad's father um, leased that dairy for many, many years before he bought the property over on the other side of the freeway. My mom and I live in Marinwood. My dad died in 2012. So the community is very, very important to us. We're just not fixated just on our property. But it is a monumental thing for us. We're actually horrified at the amount of time that it has taken the property owner to address the situation. We were contacted in April, um, excuse me, January 2013, and we were told that they were aware of their environmental um, issue in 2007. They reported it to the board in 2008. I just, you know, I can't express how irresponsible and unaccountable I think that is of the Marinwood Plaza owner not to have stepped to the plate and done the right thing for the community. It's just really, really inexcusable. inexcusable. I would just like to add that um, when we were approached by this, we tested our well in April 2013, I mean, we were really, you know, kind of spooked by the whole thing. And we got a non-detect on the PCE. We did, again, a test it in February of 2015. There was interim testing done uh, um, by Geologica, but in 2015, we, um, that's when they were doing all the drilling on the property, starting with the December 2014. February 2015, we again tested our well, non-detect. <coughs> In July 2015, Geologica had the, the well tested, and that's when we started to pick up the PCE. So you can see in five months alone, we are seeing things happening. And so time is of the essence. We cannot have any more delays. And we hear tonight that um, they are going to proceed. But it's about time, and we are going to be pushing for a multi-pronged approach. Nothing should hold up something else. They need to take care of this mess and do it quickly and efficiently and completely. So thank you very much for being here tonight.
so much more emotional and therefore more effective speaker than I am. Um, there's one other point though. The, during the presentation by Geologica, they showed the extent of plume and it was all north of Miller Creek. But since we're now getting hits, we are getting low level hits south of Miller Creek. The plume delineation on the map is where the mass of the product is, but in fact, the plume is broader than the mapping. I just wanted to point that out. All right, thank you. So Bill, why don't you tee up? Um,